Welcome to Lecture 8 for English Women's Studies 3073. I'm hoping I can get this done in two videos, but it may take three. We'll see. I don't want to rush through it, but I do want uh, to be uh, timely if I can. I'm going to start off um, our um, lesson uh, for this particular uh, uh, lecture is Southern Humor. Uh, Flannery O'Connor and Eudora Welty are the two that I chose. You could choose a lot of other ones because there's an awful lot of legacy of Southern humor. But I want to frame it by talking a little bit about um, Southern literature in the 20th century, particularly following the Civil War, obviously. Um, there was uh, a lot of emphasis on the haunting legacy of the past in the South. Um, uh, the South has a lot of baggage, right? So if you grew up in the South, if you didn't, then that's fine, but it's easy to understand that the South has a lot of baggage. Obviously, things related to race, class, all those kinds of things. Um, after the Civil War, there's a huge political power vacuum. All the families and institutions that used to run things got blank slated. And uh, modernization, industrialization came along, and the South was swept up in incredibly rapid social and political change, cultural change as well. So one of the things that's kind of um, emerges, if you look at Southern literature in the 20th century, is a, a movement or a sort of a subgenre known as Southern Gothicism. Now, we won't get all into that. Again, this is, again, we're doing a buffet here. We're just kind of dipping our toe in and taking a look at it. Southern Gothic, uh, as a subgenre, is uh, presents a, a, a works with a strong emphasis on realistic graphics, sometimes very disturbing depictions, depictions of characters and scenes. Um, sort of the haunted past is um, you know some old family um, that uh, some some dark secret in their past kind of emerges. Lots of films. Uh, one of my favorites is Hush Hush Sweet Charlotte. It's a film that came out in the 60s. If you want to see Southern Gothic on film, there's nothing better than that for that. But it's a sort of a dark view of, of, of people who are stuck in the present but who are haunted by the past kind of thing. And sometimes there's sort of um, uh, supernatural things, but other times it's just kind of uh, a sort of um, feeling that of being oppressed by the past. W Rob, uh, um, William Faulkner said, um, you can't grow up as a, as a Southerner without a sense of failure, because uh, all Southerners, be they black or white, um, have a sense of, of, of deep-seated historical failure, failure to right what's wrong, failure to, to win the war, obviously, of secession. That's one thing, obviously. But just a sense of failure that, that the South has always lagged in terms of modernization and those sorts of things. So Faulkner is all about talking about the past and, and the burden of the past and the guilt of the past, but also um, when we talk about Southern Gothicism as a movement, and there's lots and lots of different short stories. Speaking of William Faulkner, A Rose for Emily, you may be familiar with that particular short story, is very Southern Gothic. Um, uh, Southern Gothicism as a movement draws upon that past and upon the, the, the distant haunting memories of that. There's a sense of loss in 20th century Southern literature, a sense of dislocation, a sense of unresolved social issues, especially regarding race, obviously, because after the war, you didn't have equality and kumbaya and everything. You had this long period of oppression and persecution and Jim Crow and segregation regarding uh, race. Now, we're not going to get into all the heavy stuff. We're, I'm all setting this up, and, and then we're going to start talking about humor, so you're going to go, why are you talking about that? But there are elements of Southern Gothic in the humor even, right? So we're looking at the humor of Welty and O'Connor, but even the humor has some sort of social message that has something to do with the past, loss, dislocation, uh, those kinds of things. And we're going to start off with Flannery O'Connor and her short story, Revelation, okay? Um, a word about racial epithets. Listen, this short story, like so much Southern literature, deals with people who are sometimes not the best people, okay? So if you read the short story, you know Ruby is not the nicest person. She kind of gets what she's got coming to her because of that. But ultimately, if you're going to write realistic fiction with realistic characters, they're going to have to do realistic things, and they're going to have to have realistic speech. You don't depict somebody who has racist attitudes and have them use nice language, right? So if you're going to depict art, 
it through your art, if you're going to depict reality through your art, you have to depict reality as it is, not as you would like it to be. So, you know, you, you don't want to clean up the language of somebody who's a kind of a, a repulsive person, right? Otherwise, you don't have somebody who's a repulsive person anymore. You're whitewashing them. It is, sorry about the pun, but you're, you're, you're over, you're, 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 you're putting makeup on them, right? And you can't do that. So, just a word about that. Some people get a little upset by the use of the terminology, but don't think that these are Flannery O'Connor's words. These are her character's words, okay? Now, another thing you need to know about Flannery O'Connor, we're going to hit Revelation more thoroughly. Good Country People, which I think is actually a little bit funnier in some ways, but it's weirder. Um, I'll, I'll do more lightly uh, as we go on. I want to spend some more time on this one, a little bit less time on that one, then we'll spend some time with Welty. One of the things that you notice about the, um, uh, Flannery O'Connor's short stories is that they tend to follow a certain pattern. And I've kind of messed up here because um, I've got my picture over some terminology here. But you begin with a situation that involves the political, social, cultural status quo. Status quo means the things, things as they are. Okay. The world as it is. And then somehow, some way, a crisis is introduced into her story. You got people living their lives like they always do. Then some crisis happens. And then at the peak of that crisis, there's an act of violence in an O'Connor short story. This is the pattern. Again, this is you'll see this in both these short stories and just about every one of them. Then somewhere along the line, right after the violent event happens to one or more characters, some sort of epiphany, realization, or revelation happens to that character. So the character's living her life. Some crisis happens. A violent thing shakes their world, rocks their world. They come to a realization about something. They see the world differently than the way they'd been seeing it during, you know, before this crisis and violence. And then the short story generally with O'Connor ends with open questions. We don't know whether the character is going to change her life because of this revelation, because of this new understanding of things. We just know that she's presented with the opportunity to do so. So so very open questions at the end of her stories, very open-ended because we don't really sometimes know what's what the character's going to do or what's going to happen to her. Um, it kind of ends with like a fork in the road and we don't know which 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 direction the character is going to go down. Okay, So let's take a look at themes and threads in this particular short story. Um, this story at least is a part, is a, is, is a story about the problem of self perception. Who do we think we are versus who we really are? So you got Ruby and Claude. And one of the things I really love about this is that you, you've got a doctor's office, right? And you have all these characters that are in this doctor's office. Think of the office as kind of a box where you have little puppets or little figures that are in the box. They can't go anywhere, right? And it's a cross section of small town Southern life. So you have people of different classes, people of different races coming in and out, people of different backgrounds, people of different monetary, but the, the doctor's office is a place where that actually might happen, right? So in this highly segregated, very class-oriented society known as the post-Civil War South, where else are you going to bring all these people together? Well, you got to bring them together if you want some fun to happen, right? And so, um, you know, everybody enters the place thinking that they're who they are, and that's normal, and that's what the world should be like. Ruby, of course, is our main character. She's in there because Claude got kicked by a cow or some such thing. And uh, we get to see um, Ruby kind of examining everybody else in the room as she's kind of thinking it over. She has a habit. Um, by the way, the lady in the bottom right is not Ruby. I just picked the most Ruby-looking person I could find. Sorry. Um, and um, she goes around the room, and of course, she starts categorizing people. She starts pigeonholing them, putting them in little boxes, right? That's this type of lady. This is the respectable, fashionable lady. This is the white trash lady. Um, this is the lady whose daughter is, you know, one of these intellectuals who's, you know, a terribly unattractive, frumpy-looking kid who's mean and angry and bitter about life. She has that character a lot, by the way. And then you got Ruby, who's very proud of who she is, very proud of what um, her uh, sh her life has been. She sees herself as being very respectable, better than most people, not quite as good as other people, and so on. And she loves to use all these cliches, right? Well, as long as you've been such a good, as long as you've got a good disposition, I don't think it makes a bit of difference what size you are. You just can't beat a good disposition, right? Um, and, uh, takes, you know, it, it takes all kinds to make the world go around. Bird in the hand is worth two in the bush. Penny saved is penny. You, you know what I'm talking about? The cliches. 
Ruby loves cliches. Why does she love cliches? Well, I think it reveals something about how unoriginal a thinker she is, that she has to quote other people rather than come up with her own ideas. The setting, as I said, provides a kind of a mixer for the social classes and races, and what happens when you bring them all together. Let's take a look at page 730, where Ruby's classifying all these people. And she's in there, and of course, what's ironic is there's there's gospel music playing in the background. And you and I might be thinking, you know, you really ought to think a little bit more about the gospel music and, and being a little bit more like God or trying to aspire to God's commandments rather than being just this horrible bigot. But before you go ready to shoot Ruby, understand that I think one of the things that O'Connor's trying to show you is Ruby is the way she is because that's the way she's been raised. It's not an excuse for being a bad person. It's not an excuse for remaining ignorant. But she's never questioned what she's been taught. She's never questioned that she and Claude are better than these white trash people. She's better than African American people. She's better than this and that there are other people. She's never questioned the status quo ever until now we get a crisis, right? So there's a lank faced woman who was certainly the child's mother, the kind of a white trashy lady. She had on a yellow sweatshirt and wine colored slacks, both gritty looking and the rims of her lips were stained with snuff. Her dirty yellow hair uh, was tied behind with a little piece of red ribbon. And this, this is Ruby's words, okay? It's not Flannery O'Connor. She says, Ruby's thinking, worse than niggers any day, Mrs. Turpin thought, right? And that's the way she was raised to think. But what Flannery O'Connor wants is she wants to present her characters with some sort of moment of crisis, sometimes violent, where you have to rethink the way you've thought all your life. She wants to do that. Well, you're going to see it happen, right? You read the story. You know what's going to happen. Uh, she starts sizing people up by their shoes, even. Like, eh, that person wears these shoes. That makes her this kind of class. That person wears those kinds of shoes. She looks like that. Um, and then she she even says, the narrator even says, sometimes at night when she couldn't go to sleep, Mrs. Turpin would occupy herself with the question of who she would have chosen to be if she couldn't have been herself. If Jesus had said to her before he uh, before he made her, there's only two places available for you. You can either be a nigger or white trash. Imagine a Jesus who would say that. It's just the most absurd thing. O'Connor wants you to say, oh my God, this woman actually thinks Jesus would say a word like that. Um, what would she have said? Please, Jesus, please, she would say, just just let me be. wait until there's another place available. Like Jesus is up there like loading people up into like little transporters to send them down to earth and and he would have said no you have to go right now and i have only those two places so make up your mind she would have wiggled and squirmed and begged and pleaded but it would have been no use uh, and and finally she would say all right then make me a nigger but that don't mean a trashy one and he would have made her a clean neat respectable negro woman herself but black like the the, the incredibly I mean, that's a, that, that belongs on Dr. Phil, right? I mean, that's just like, unpack that for a moment psychologically. It's just bizarro. She looks at the young red-headed woman um, who's uh, working a piece of chewing gum, hell for leather, as Claude would say, and she says, sometimes Mrs. Turpin occupied her, herself at, at night naming the classes of people. Who does that? Who, who goes through falling asleep saying, okay, who's better than who, right? But Evidently, Ruby does, because it's the world she was brought up in, right? She's trying to make sense of the world through a warped system, okay? The system that she was brought up in is warped. It's, it, it doesn't make sense, and it doesn't make sense to her either. On the bottom of the heap were most colored people, not the kind she would have been if she had been one. Of course not. No, I'd be, if I were a black person, I'd be a really nice black person. Um, uh, not the kind she would have been if she had been one, but most of them. Ne next to them, not above, just away from. We're the white trash, right? Got to have segregation. Not above, just away from. Okay, <laughs> got to separate the races here. But we're the white trash. Then above them were the homeowners, and above them the home and landowners, to which she and Claude belonged. Above she and Claude. Notice the use of the pronoun there. It's, it should be Claude and her, but she's got to put she. She's got to come before Claude. Uh, were people a lot of money and bigger houses and more land, but there was a complexity of it begin to bear in on her. For some of the people with a lot of money were common and ought to be below she and Claude. And some of the people who had good blood had lost their money and had to rent. And then there were colored people who owned their houses and land as well. There was a colored dentist in town who had two red Lincolns and a swimming pool and a farm with registered white-faced cattle on it. Usually by the time she had fallen, how could that be, right? Wait a minute. Black people aren't supposed to have more than what white people do. That just doesn't make sense. That's not the hierarchy. That's not the way the world should be, according to Ruby. Um, by the time 
Um, usually by the time she had fallen asleep, all the classes of people were moiling and roiling around in her head, and she would dream they were all crammed in together in a boxcar being ridden off to be put in a gas oven. Whoa! Right? She's half asleep and she's kind of drifting off. Eh, let's just gas everybody. I mean, do you, this is a clear reference to the Holocaust, okay? So what, I mean, I, I don't think, I don't think Ruby is a, is a full-fledged Nazi, but O'Connor's basically trying to say, you want to know where Nazism comes from? You know, you want to know where that, that acceptance of, of, uh, you know, the idea of exterminating people comes from? It comes from people who think they're actually decent people like Ruby does. It comes from people who, who just blindly accept the world as it's given to them without saying, hey, wait a minute, that's not right. This isn't, this isn't a good thing. Um, the system that we have isn't, you know, she's, she's satisfied with the world the way it is because it's been good to her, right? It's been perfectly good to her. And so she's got no reason to complain. I mean, she has a little bit of everything that she wants uh, involved. Well, all this builds and so on, and she has this conversation with the other respectable people in the room, and they're saying snarky things about the not-so-respectable people. Um, and so uh, they would, and, and just using all kinds of horrible uh, terminology and saying terrible things, um, uh, and, and until finally, and she keeps throwing out the cliches, until finally... The college girl who's been reading a textbook, take a look at the title, it's quite revealing, decides she has had enough. Once the the discussion about sending black people back to Africa comes up, that's about it. The the gospel song that comes over the loudspeaker in the in, in the waiting room says, You go to blank blank and I'll go to mine, but we'll all blank along together, and all along the blank we'll hep each other out, smiling in every kind of weather. Mrs. Turpin says, thinks to herself, to help anybody out that needed it was her philosophy of life. She never spared herself when she found somebody in need, whether they were white or black, trash or decent. You know, I help everybody, even if they're scum. <laughs> I'm a great person. What? Anyway, uh, and of all she had to be thankful for, she was most thankful that this, that this was so. If Jesus had said, you can be high society and have all the money you want and be thin and svelte like, but you can't be a good woman with it, she would have had to say, well, don't make me that then. Make me a good woman and it don't matter what else, how fat or how ugly or how poor. Her heart rose. He had not made her a nigger or white trash or ugly. He had made her herself and given her a little of everything. Jesus, thank you, she said. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Whenever she counted her blessings, she felt, thank you for making me so much better than other people. <laughs> what? Right? This is, a, this is a warped view of Christianity for sure, as though Jesus would, right? Whenever she counted her blessings, she felt as buoyant as if she weighed 125 pounds instead of 180, right? She says, she goes at the bottom of page 370, uh, 737, if it's one thing I am, it's grateful, said Ruby. When I think of all who I could have been besides myself and all I got, a little of everything and a good disposition besides, I just feel like shouting, thank you, Jesus, for making everything the way it is. It could have been different. For one thing, someone could have got clawed. At the thought of this, she was flooded with gratitude and a terrible pang of joy ran through her. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Jesus, thank you, she cried aloud. The book struck her directly over the left eye. <laughs> I love I love this. There comes the violets, right? Whop! Right upside the head. Oh, and speaking of cliches, what does the girl do? She throws the book at her, right? So there's a hidden cliche. Pow! Right upside the head. Of course, the girl jumps on top of her and calls her a warthog from hell. They pull her off. All these things happen. Ruby is totally, totally traumatized. Not just because she got hit in the head with a book, but because someone grabbed her and basically said, you are a despicable human being because she had just spent the last half hour or whatever it is thinking, I'm such a, I'm so grateful that I'm a good person. And then suddenly this girl says, you are the most repulsive thing I've ever seen. You're a warthog from hell is what you are. And she spends, of course, the rest of the story after this revelation, right? After this violence that maybe she's not what she thought she was having to deal with that. And she understands at the end, this is God speaking to her. O'Connor was a very de devout person religiously and believed that it was our responsibility in life to not just accept everything we've been taught, but to rethink things. And sometimes God moves in ways that 
shakes us up. And sometimes he has to smack us upside the head, literally, with a book, maybe, with somebody else. She knows where this came from right? It takes her a while. She goes back home. She's scooting down her pig. Oh, by the way, her pigs are better than other people's pigs because her pigs are not in mud. They're on concrete, right? Took me a long time to find a picture of pigs on concrete, but I got one up there for you. Anyway, uh, and that's her home, by the way, below, uh, below that in Milledgeville, Georgia, which is still preserved and you can tour it if you want to. She was uh, big on peacocks. She loved peacocks. And so some of the descendants of her original peacocks are still at her home there, which you can tour. But she has a vision at the end, right? And she says, she rants and raves against God just before she's given a vision. She says, why me? Why did you, in other words, what did you do this for? You know, what did, what did you send me a message like that for? She's, she's shaking her fist at God and yelling at him. She said in a low, fierce voice, barely above a whisper, but with the force of a shout and its con concentrated fury, how am I a hog and me both? How am I saved and from hell too? Well, the answer, if you're an Orthodox Christian is, all of us are, lady. We're all pigs and people too. We're also we're all a mixture of of the divine and the and the sinful and the ugly, right? How are you saved and from hell too? By grace, basically. A good theologian would come along and say, "Yeah, yep, yep. We're all we all deserve that, but we don't all have to go there." Um, her first free her free fist was knotted, and with the other she gripped the hose, blindly pointing the stream of water in and out of the eye of the old sow, whose outraged squeal she did not hear. If you don't see the symbolism of that, right, the sow whose squeal, right, because the eye she's getting squirted in the eye, right? Why me? It's no trash around here, black or white, that I haven't given to, and break my back to the bone every day, working and do for the church, which is probably true. She has been generous but she's a little bit full of herself. How am I a hog? Exactly how am I like them? And she jabbed the stream of water at the shoats. There was plenty of trash there. It didn't have to be me. If you like trash better, go get yourself some trash then. She's talking to God like this. You could have made me trash or a nigger. If trash is what you wanted, why didn't you make me trash? She shook her fist with the hose in it and a watery snake appeared momentarily in the air. You ever done that with a hose, garden hose? You create a kind of a water snake. Oh, there's a snake. Where does this kind of thinking come from, huh? Use your, use your head there. Look at the symbolism. I could quit working and take it easy and be filthy, lounge about the sidewalks all day, drinking root beer, dip snuff, and spit in every puddle and have it all over my face. I could be nasty, right? And then she says, she says, Go on, she yelled. Call me a hog. Call me a hog again. From hell. Call me a warthog from hell. Put that bottom rail on top. There'll still be a top and a bottom. In a final surge of fury, a final surge of fury shook her and she roared, Who do you think you are? The color of everything, field and crimson sky, burned for a moment with a transparent intensity. The question, who do you think you are? carried over the pasture and across the highway in the cotton field and returned to her clearly like an answer from beyond the wood. She yells to God, Who do you think you are? And it echoes. And what would it sound like if that were to echo? Who do you think you are? Right? You see? Who do you think you are? You know, thinking that you've got it all figured out. She gets that final vision there. And the final vision is of all the people that she thinks is beneath her, singing and marching and dancing their way into heaven. And she's at the rear. The first shall be last, the last shall be first, right? And she says, and she, 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 she sees this vision of all the people that she thinks are her inferiors at the front of the line, even crazy people, irresponsible people, low class people, white trash people up at the front of the line marching up to heaven. They're ahead of her. Yeah, dipping snuff and dancing and spitting and all that kind of stuff. And she and Claude and people like her are at the back, bringing up the rear, well-dressed and responsible, but bringing up the rear. Who do you think you are? The vision tells her the answer to that. You've been given a lot. That doesn't mean you're better. That means you have more responsibilities. Use them wisely. I think that's what it is. But we don't know whether Ruby's going to take this advice. We don't know whether she's going to change her life. Open question. Status quo. Crisis. Violence. A revelation. What will she do about it? We're not told. We'll look briefly at the other uh, O'Connor story in the next video, and then possibly Petrified Man as well.